Okay. So I think I'm back, but let's see. I'm not sure. Can you just go to my um, channel and and go? Thank you. Okay. So how do I now get in to see the chat? Here we go. All right. Let's see. We should be good. Are you in? better okay so I needed to mute my screen that's weird all right we are back mark has been a gem thank you mark but we're ready to go and I am trying to see something all right so we've got we've got it all set up I think we're good one more thing I'm gonna do, make sure that my PowerPoint is ready to go. Yep, okay. Hello, welcome back. Thank you for going through technical difficulties with me. Uh, moral of the story, needed to mute my computer. I can't hear it, but I guess it was picking up some weird feedback. So, grateful that um, I didn't stress out too much. It's always stressful, especially when you're up, you wanna be on time uh, <laughs> for something, but that's okay. Um, I. And Mark commented if you want to try your mic. I do have my mic on now. Yes, the good mic, the good mic. Uh, okay, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about setting up for the school year. Now, I know we're still on summer break. I'm still technically on summer break mode. My mind is still on summer break, but I don't have long until I go back for the school year. And so as somebody who's been in the schools for, I'm going into my seventh year, I want to touch on things I will continuously do at the beginning of every school year to set myself up for success, to find that life work balance that's really important to me, which is something that, you know, uniquely we're all going to figure out how to do um, on our own. But I want to give you some like life hacks, some SLP life hacks to be able to do so. Also, I want to make sure for all of my new SLPs and even maybe slippers that I have given you some guidance, given you the support, and helped you find a way to build that solid foundation going into your first year at, in the school. So even if you're not a CF, but you are starting in the schools for the first time, or you're returning after a while, um, I wanna make sure that you feel ready, as ready as you can, uh, to go into the year, and again, just have that life-work balance. So um, I said this in the first live, but hopefully, uh, hopefully we have people come finding us um, because of the technology you know we got to be grateful for it but uh, it does get a little frustrating at frustrating at times but I am open to any and all questions comments anything you want to share throughout the live stream so please feel free to plug that in there this is going to remain up on my YouTube page um, for for anybody that either has to step away during it or come back and, and go away, all those things, or um, if you weren't able to watch it live, it is here for you as a resource. Um, and also if you are you know, wanting to go back to any specific topic that we go over right now, then uh, you have this as kind of your guidebook because I might talk fast, but again, you can slow me down. <laughs> all right, so let's see if this works. Yes, it's working, it's working, we're going. All right, I'm gonna get a little smaller here. Let's see, we need to get down. We need to, I'm gonna get really small, okay? Ooh, technology is fun if it doesn't glitch on you, you know? All right, so I can see the chat. Um, I also can see my little PowerPoint here and I think that's all we need. So again, questions, feel free to throw them in there. But let's talk about setting up for the school year as a school-based speech, language, and pathologist. A little about me, if you don't know, I am a preschool speech pathologist in a public school district. I am a district employee. Now that is something that I want to make sure I'm very 
open about because I know that even school based we have you know we have SLPs in the medical field we have SLPs in private practice we have SLPs in early intervention we have SLPs doing home health we're all over the place our our credentialing our uh, certificate of clinical competence can really take us anywhere and then you get to the schools and you're like yeah I'm a school based SLP but then you could be a contract um, SLP you could work you know for a contract company you could be a sole proprietor kind of a thing where you're contracting yourself um, you could be a part of an assessment team you could be a part of the actual district and fall under the teachers union like myself so there's just kind of this whole other array or pos of possibilities um, so I want to make sure that you understand I'm public school SLP so some of the time some of the time my perspective is coming from that idea that I am part of a union um, the uh, CTA the California Teachers Association right yeah and um, I uh, I do have that lens but I do communicate and collaborate a lot with SLPs that come from that contractor side of things in the school so I do understand there are some differences for us um, there are some similarities but some of the stuff is still going to apply most of the stuff I'm sorry will apply there's a few things that um, and I'll talk about it when we get there that maybe will be a little bit different but I still want to help you navigate that as somebody that is on that other side. I'm also the owner of thanksmorris.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram at thanksmorris. I've created a gratitude journal. I have created courses for speech language pathologists because I'm very passionate about empowering you to build mindful habits, to have life work balance and prevent burnout, and as well as understand how to kind of hack your role as an SLP in a sense. I'm very passionate about inclusion. I do work for a full inclusion preschool program, which is amazing. Um, I'm happy to answer any and all questions about that as well. And I would love to do a live, actually, it's specifically on inclusion. I think that would be really fun. So that is on the on the docket, so to speak. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's of um, arts in the communicative sciences and disorders uh, back in 2015. And then in 2017, I graduated with my master's um, of science and speech pathology or communicative sciences and disorders in, uh, what did I say, 2017? Yeah, that's when I graduated with my master's. So um, I have now been doing this for over half a decade. What? Crazy. So today, what you will take away, um, first we're gonna talk about things to do when you're getting ready for the school year. We're just gonna sit back and literally like visualize all the things you can do to really just set yourself up for success. If you're going from, you know, more of a comfortable environment, let's say you're going from grad school to a school-based environment, you're going from that comfort of grad school, from your cohort, from the same teachers, from the clinic. Um, you're going into a whole new environment. So you're stepping into something uncomfortable, which is great. And it's where you're going to grow a lot. But how can we set things up to help you maneuver and navigate that? We're also going to talk about establishing meaningful connections with both students and staff, which again, that kind of falls right into getting ready for a successful school year. And then I do want to spend a good chunk of this time talking about preventative measures for burnout. Now, I do have something very exciting for you. So if you stay through to the end, I do, I will share that, but you have to watch the end. So let's start. Okay. So when you're getting started, just again, just we're just thinking about, you know, I, I go back in two weeks, so I'm just thinking about these things. Doesn't mean I have to feel like tomorrow I need to get into my speech room and start doing anything. Let's let's start with with what we can just focus on right now. And I think a lot of that is our mindset. It's getting our mindset kind of there. So you're just four things we can kind of consider and keep in mind. The first thing I've listed is setting up your environment. I wanted to put something super exciting and fun first. Well, they're all fun, but like setting up your speech room, however big or how small is something so exciting. I remember my first speech room when I was shown around the campus, we were looking for a space for me to be in. Um, <laughs> I feel like every speech pathology has like their their story of their first speech room especially in the schools because you know you hear your I was in the pod oh I was in the janitor's you know closet like we hear all those stories and uh, some of them are true uh, I was 
told I was going to share a room with the band teacher. Um, and I was going to have this little corner of the room and we would just put up like little shelves in between. Um, luckily, I didn't have to say anything out loud. There was another SLP that said, I don't think the band room is appropriate because it's literally like we need attention and we need to work on listening and we're working on, you know, specifically like being able to attend to the kids and their speech sounds like all those things. So my principal was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's not a good idea. So we kept looking for rooms for me. Like we literally were walking around this hot campus because it was beginning of August. And um, finally we came to a little room, the janitor's closet, which it wasn't super tiny, um, it, but it was not set up like other rooms, other classrooms, other speech pathologist rooms in our district where you know they at least had a sink, a couple cabinets for storage. It was just four walls and a door and a cute little window right by the cafeteria, which I really loved that room. And I was so excited to buy my bulletin board, get the borders, create this beautiful tree. I should have inserted a picture of it. Wow. Okay. I will share a picture of it, uh, maybe on Instagram <laughs> for you. But I was so excited and I spent the, a good two months at the beginning of that school year, like really curating my perfect speech room. And I loved it. And it's, it's so surface level, but for me, I'm an environment person. My environment really helps my flow of work helps my creativity. So I think about all those things now. I didn't know to think about them then, but like, which way is my desk facing? What colors are calming or what colors are energizing? Um, do I have a space where I can just sit and not be facing my computer? Things like that. So when you're thinking about setting up your environment, like let yourself get creative and let yourself get excited about the decor of your speech room because why not? Um, some really fun things too to keep in mind especially if you're kind of like starting out and you're like oh but i have a budget for this like i or i can't really spend money right now on setting up the speech room because i've also been there um your school might have like extra things i just just last year realized there's a whole big drawer in our workroom full of bulletin borders cute ones and i was like oh, you mean i didn't have to like buy my own so <laughs> Just things like that too if you're not looking to really break the bank on decorations or anything. Also I was at a thrift shop the other day, you guys. There were like cute like um like vintagey looking like prints. Just like little prints you could hang on the wall that would be really cute and like really calming. It was like a scene of boats on the ocean. I was like that that could be a vibe in my speech room. But I didn't get it because I already have it's preschool. I have fun colors and things like that everywhere. But you know, just for the thought of it. Um the next thing I want to talk about too is prioritizing yourself as a human. I say this and I will say it until the cows come home. You must prioritize yourself as a human first. Being a speech pathologist, even, you know, that might even come way down in the line. Um, you know, you might be a boyfriend, a girlfriend first, a wife, a husband. You might be a sister, a daughter, like you have all these different roles in life and very first, you are you, you are a human. And so when you're thinking about setting up for any job or anything, you must remember that you're a human first. And that means that you've got to take time to connect with yourself. And so when you're starting out, whether it's in the schools or anywhere else, you having that kind of ability to just say, hey, I'm going to check in on myself, whether it's once a week, once a day, um, is really big. And then another piece of that is really understanding what you can honor that keeps yourself just inspired, maybe creatively, um, that helps you rest, that you enjoy, like make sure you're including things in your week, in your routines that are bringing that joy for you every day. So you can honor yourself as a human first. We're going to talk later on about setting boundaries and that is a big thing to like start to kind of think about like where do I need to set my boundaries to be able to honor myself as a human first. So keep that in mind as well. Um, that and that kind of goes hand in hand with my next point here which is establishing healthy routines. So start now. If your school year isn't starting for another two weeks or another two months, no matter what, start building in those routines. Actually, a big 
goal of mine next week, because next week is my last full week of summer break. And every year I make sure I take that last week. I don't make a lot of plans. This is actually, was my big week of, of like plans of beach trips and, you know, hanging out with friends and stuff. Um, next week is kind of going to be my week to set myself up to get those healthy routines, especially like the morning routines that are so vital for me as a human, um, kind of in place and determine what it is that I really want to focus on. And then you also want to make sure that you are connected with what your why is. And I think we talk about this a lot over on like SLP Instagram or SLP TikTok about like, what's your why? Connect with your why. And it, it really is something that is just helpful to be considering as we navigate maybe some more tense situations or we come across some challenges when we are focused on, well, why are we doing what we're doing in our role as an SLP? But this is also, this can go for other roles in life. Um, it really helps us get grounded and then kind of decide, so am I willing to maybe cross this bridge because it actually doesn't really align with my why. And so when we're really in tune with that or we are reflecting on that consistently, um, I do find that it helps us as we're navigating new situations. Another thing about that, and this is just kind of as you go along with your career as a speech pathologist, your why can change. And, and if it does, that's great. If it doesn't, that's great. But it, you're allowed to have it change. And it might just be because you experience some different things as you go. And so you've you know, it just kind of changes. Your passion for whatever it is you're doing as a speech pathologist might change and it might take you down a different road. And I just want you to feel empowered to say, you know what, my why changed, now I'm doing this. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. But as you get started, it's always helpful to have that to kind of connect with. Okay, last two things to just keep in mind. It's okay not to know everything. It's okay not to know everything. Just stay open to the learning process of everything and you're gonna do great. Um, and this goes right along with it. Asking questions is okay. I always think of it like if I'm asking questions, because I used to, when I was a CF, I was not open to asking questions. I thought that meant I probably shouldn't be a speech pathologist because I didn't know what I was doing. Okay, well here's a funny thing. I still don't really always feel like I know what I'm doing. And I'm okay to not know everything that I'm doing. Um, I used to it used to really overwhelm me when people would come out with these like materials and be like, yeah, you can use this for auditory bombardment. And I remember my second year as an SLP, somebody said that and like I had a total blank. And I was like, wait, what? What is auditory bombardment? And look, it, either I can forget things or I can just not have known exactly what they meant when I was in grad school because I was so inundated with information it's okay because when I'm asking questions I am bettering myself as a speech pathologist and overall I'm bettering the environment for my students to learn in so I've chosen to look at it that way and it's really helped me on a lot of different in a lot of different ways one just being easy on myself as a human first giving myself grace um, with you know when I don't know something instead of critiquing myself I'm saying okay well you're gonna know it now and we move past it. Um, but I think it also creates this environment where we are saying it's okay not to know everything. We're all here to work together and collectively we can help each other. We all have different areas of strengths. And so, um, you know, when we are collaborating with teachers or service providers or other SLPs, it's okay to be like, hey, you have this really great resource and I need to know more about that. Can you share that with me? Or what did you learn from it? Um, so. That's definitely something to, to really keep in mind. All right, let's get started with your school year. So now we're gonna kind of fast forward a little bit um, and think about what to do. I'm gonna take a sip of water though before I fast forward, okay? Because, <laughs> yeah. But now we're thinking about what to do when, like in that first week to two weeks, that you are in your speech room, you're in your at your school. Now, I know that we're not all gonna have the same experience, even in like a very physical way of like, like I, my first year and even last year and then this year, I was a split site SLP. 
So for my CF year, I was between two sites. I was with two different teams. I was scheduling meetings and sessions at two different in two different places and really had to navigate kind of that idea of being in two places at once. It really felt like it. Then four years go by and I'm at one site. And then last year, I got to be split between two sites again. But luckily, I knew a little bit more about that. Going into this year, I'll be split at three sites. So um, just because our preschool program has changed and grown, which is great. Um, but that just means that I'm more of a traveling SLP now. And um, so some of these things I'm really going to be kind of doubling down on. Um, but like I said, it, what am I trying to say? <laughs> Basically that, you know, we might have kind of a different setup for how our roles as school-based SLPs will look because of different things, different environmental factors, geography, like it, there's a, always something that could be a little bit different but whether you're split between sites whether you're at one site um, whether your caseload is small or big these are things that you can really focus on at in whatever capacity you're in um, the first thing that I put and this is really huge because this is something that really helped me and continues to help me was to get in touch with your fellow SLPs I always say this but they're your lifeline you are like I said we don't we're not gonna know everything everybody's gonna have different strengths different weaknesses in certain areas where we can always learn more and we can take those opportunities to learn whether it's through CEUs but really the people that are gonna be right there ready to share their information the quickest are your fellow SLPs in your district if you are a contract employee I had this question come up recently in a coaching session and I asked if they had access to the other SLPs in the district if they had their emails or if there was a way they could get them. And so she reached out to an administrator um, who was able to share the email list of the SLPs because when you're a contract employee you don't always get added to that email list and it makes your job harder when you can't, you know, different. every district does things differently when it comes to writing IEPs for instance. So if you need help checking certain boxes those SLPs are going to be the ones to ask because they know exactly, you know, when an SLP is writing an IEP, what it could look or what it should look like. So get in touch with those SLPs. Um, I put it last, but I want to talk a little bit more about determining what questions to ask because that kind of goes into, uh, you know, when you're getting in touch with those SLPs, if you have questions, if you need to find things, for instance, I don't know, you know, if you need to find your caseload. Let's just let's just use that as the example. You know, if you need to figure out how to log into the server, um, ask the SLPs. Like what I've learned, uh, and and I'm biased because I'm on the speechy side of things. But the minute I send an email to all of the SLPs in my district, I get at least ten emails back with an answer, and they might be different because we all have different perspectives. But I have so much support and guidance. Um, and the more you get to know them, you realize who specializes in what. Like, I know which SLP to go to when I need help with um, supervising Slippus because she has all the latest information. She's always well-researched. And so anything where I need an update on anything, I go to her. Um, you know, when I need some help with planning my early intervention sessions or my preschool sessions, I have my speech pathologist to go to who's always, like, figuring that stuff out the quickest. Um, you're probably like, Marie, well, what do you... <laughs> What do you contribute? <laughs> no, um, you know when they need when they need a, the reminder to take a break, they come to me. Um, I'm just messing around, but that's kind of the idea. Is as the more you connect with them, even if you are a contractor, uh, an outside contractor, the better off you are because you'll figure out who you can ask certain questions to. But as you're getting set up, maybe make yourself like grab a big post-it note and just have it there so you can just brain dump any questions you have. Like let's say the second day you're in, after because the first day might be really overwhelming, you might just need to like get there and sit around and look around and maybe determine how you're gonna decorate your room. And that might be it for the day. Like that's okay because it's a lot to, to change or to start out at a new environment or whatever it might be for you. But if you have that kind of place where you can just brain dump your questions and the next day you go and you're like, okay, I need to figure out this, 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 and you write them all down, then you can sit and like type up a question, you know, thread to your, and email it out to the SLPs and say, can anybody answer these questions? I guarantee you they're going to be more than happy to respond. Um, 
in those first two weeks, it's a really good idea to make some kind of first contact with the families that you're working with, especially if you're new coming into a new caseload. Something I like to do, it's really easy um, and doesn't, you know, it, it's not taking, like you're not having to sit and call family after family on your caseload. I just have a generic welcome letter, you know, hi, my name is Marie Murataya. I um, will be working with your child this year in speech and language, and I'm really excited. And you can kind of just briefly outline your philosophy. For me, for instance, I'm preschool, so I talk a lot in my newsletter just about we play, we sing, I work on a lot of imitation, um, those kinds of things, you know, following their lead. Like, I, that's what I write in my letter. And then I always leave a contact, an email, and my school number so they can call me or email me and it just kind of opens that door. And it's a really easy way because I just send it home, I give, you know, write, write each kid's name at the top of one of them, give them to the teachers, ask them to send it home with the kids or put it in their little files and and that's it. I've, I've made that contact. Um, so that's really good and I just think that establishes that rapport really fast um, and lets parents know that, you know, you're, you're there, you're a resource for them and it's really beneficial to make those connections. Another thing too is to um, start establishing those collaborative relationships with your teachers, with your administrators and support team. We're going to talk more about how you can kind of get started with this because I know when I was a new school based SLP, I was really nervous about this. I was so intimidated to talk to the teachers and had somebody kind of been there to show me and remind me just how, how to get to know somebody, because it was in this professional environment, and here I am, the speech pathologist, um, I think it would have been very helpful. So that is kind of the last piece. Um, and connecting with admin, it kind of goes along with that, you know, establishing that collaborative relationship. Sometimes I think that, um, you know, we see the admin as, you know, people that are kind of coming in to check up on us and make sure, you know, we're doing our jobs and whatnot. And I personally have found that not to be true. I've had very supportive admin um, and built really great connections with them. But a thing that I like to just recommend we always do is, again, remember, they're also a human first. So asking people, you know, how they are, maybe asking them more about themselves. Um, we're coming in from summer break. So just asking, like, what did you do this summer? Oh, you like... You like going to, you know, camping trips or whatever. Like, that's cool. I camped as a kid. I don't know. You make a connection, right? Um, speaking of, let's talk more about that. So when we're establishing meaningful connections, I'm, I'm talking first. Excuse me. I'm talking more about, I'm talking first about teachers and staff. Because as a school-based SLP, these are probably going to be the people that you have the first chance to make contact with. Um, and then you're going to be meeting your students maybe later because I know for me I go back a week before students start so that's when I am this year you know I'll be meeting new staff at a new school that I'm working at because I'm taking on a third school site but I also go back saying hi you know reconnecting with my staff members my friends the teachers and everything that I've been working with for a couple years now um, so how do we build rapport with our colleagues well, <laughs> the same way we do this with our students. Fancy that, huh? We focus on connection. Um, you know, it's, it's intimidating. It's intimidating to be in a group, in a room, I mean, with other professionals and you're the only SLP. Like, let's just, let's just say it. I get that sometimes we're like, oh, please, please don't come to me with a student referral already. Like, the kids haven't even started. Like, I get that there's that level of it, too. Um, something that I that has helped me be less intimidated is to remind myself I'm I'm like I'm a teacher too and I know you know we are the speech pathologist like we have a different job title a different role and that's so valid and true and I I 100% support that but when I'm in that room like we have so in my district what we typically do on the very first day back is we have this big meeting everybody's in the multi-purpose room together and my very first year of that I was like shaking and the second year I was shaking again and then the third year I was like oh my gosh like I'm I get to sit with my preschool team like another I'm just I'm another educator and it just really helps me kind of feel like they're not all like looking at me as oh that's a speech pathologist and I'm not over here like I'm just a speech pathologist like 
it, I don't know. It's just a mindset thing for me. And so just kind of remembering that, like, we let's focus on the connection between us. Let's not focus on the job titles so much is helpful. Um, something to keep in mind, too, you're going to walk into a lot of classrooms. <laughs> And every classroom is different, and so it's really important. I always tell this to like any interns, any CFs I mentor, any um, any observers that come in, that I really want to respect the classroom cultures. When I walk into their classrooms, I'm not going in trying to teach people how to do their job, essentially. I can be a resource, and I can, of course, at the end of the day, my first thing is to advocate for my students. Um, but I'm not going to go in and say, well, maybe you, that bulletin board is a little loud, you know, like, <laughs> no. Um, or I'm not going to go in and try, you know, to manage behaviors any differently than the teacher, that the teacher's got it under control, things like that. Like, I go in to be a support. I don't go in to take over, I guess is kind of what I'm trying to say. Um, and so when you're starting off and you are building those connections, Respecting that classroom culture is really, it's just really powerful because I think we want we want our classroom culture, our speech room culture to be respected. I know my first year I had, I had it very much disrespected by another professional while I was working with some students. Um, that person walked in, sat down at my speech table and started complaining about a situation and to me that was like super disrespectful to my classroom culture. I didn't want that person back in my room because that was really, it. one, it took my attention away from my students. It took time out of my student session, which was not okay. Um, and it was just embarrassing. Like, I, I was just like, wow, like in front of my kids, you came in and you basically like chastised me and now you want to come back into my speech room? I don't think so. Like I was so turned off by that. Um, and I would never want another human to feel that way when I walked into their room. Um, seek to support these teachers. Um, if you are teaching them something or guiding them with something, make sure that you, you understand the value that it's adding to their classroom, that it's not, again, stepping on their way of doing things or, you know, trying to change what they're doing as long unless it's like really harmful to students but um, sometimes I think we have a tendency to think like well I, I know what I'm doing as far as communication and I don't see it happening here like sometimes those changes happen slowly over time as you build the connection and I know sometimes we, we do we want to be like um that I think that is like sensory wise that's not helping our students but we just want to, you know, make those suggestions and give that advice kind of little by little sometimes if it's kind of what's going on in the classroom is what I'm trying to say. Um, and we want to learn. I think that's a big one. Like we want to be, we want to be supportive, but we also want to know that like, or we want to keep in mind that we don't know, again, it goes back to that. We don't know everything. We are there to also be learning. I learned about my kids, my students so much when I sit and I watch how the teachers interact with them. I then learn, oh, they really respond to this, this, you know, communication style so well. I need to, you know, try that with them. So some of my, the teachers I've worked with have been my best teachers, I guess. As my students have been my number one best teachers, but the teachers have also taught me so much about being a speech pathologist. So just some quick tips to kind of wrap this up. Um, stay open to learning, put students first, always advocate for the students first, respect the classroom culture, and offer supports to staff and teachers where you can. One thing that um, I started to mention and I didn't, let me go back really quick, yeah. Um, when you are building those connections with your colleagues, again, you just always want to remember they are also a human first. Talk about them, get to know them as humans. Um, you know, I work with a lot of really great moms. Like, they, I, when I'm a mom one day, they're going to be the people I'm calling, like, for advice. Um, but they're so passionate about their kids and being moms, and so it's always been really great to, like, ask them how their kids are doing and um, really get to know them that way and get to know their little ones. And so, you know, I've built a lot of really, really good friendships with some of the teachers that I work with, and I'm so, so grateful. So now let's transition this into talking about how we are establishing connections with our new students. So, you know, maybe this is week 
week one of seeing students, week two, like where you're just still kind of getting to know them. One thing I want to say too is it can take two, three, maybe even four weeks of just focusing on building rapport with kids. And I know, I know, we're like, wait, but we need to start taking data. We need to start pro getting ready for progress reporting, all that stuff. Your sessions will be so much better off if you take the time and you fill it out. Some students you like build instant connections with, some take a little longer. But give that time because in the long run, that relationship driven communication piece is going to take your students so much further. Um, especially like I work with preschoolers, sometimes it does take a couple months to really kind of build that trust in that environment. And so, and you, and you figure out what works for them. You spend a month pulling them into your speech room and you realize, oh my gosh, the problem was I wasn't meeting them in their environment. I need to push in like, and that's okay. It's okay. It takes time. Human connection is one of the most brilliant things and it's just wild how different it is every time you're connecting with a new human. So I'm going to go over just a couple different strategies that I use um, just very briefly, but uh, these are things that I do all day, every day. Um, and when I'm building rapport, of course, I'm really focusing on these. But the first is the owl. If you haven't heard of it, it's the observe, wait, and listen. Um, so let's say you bring in a, a group of students or one student for the first time, and you have something to play with, whether it's a tabletop game, depending on their age, maybe it is, you know, maybe it's Pop the Pig or um, Apples to Apples if you're working with middle schoolers, whatever that might be. But you're still kind of the idea here is regardless of their age, you are kind of getting down to their level, you're being, you're having fun, you're, you know, if, if you have them playing apples to apples, like, you better get in there and also play. You got to play the game. I notice that my kids, even my preschoolers, respond so much better when we play the games too. I mean, cause what fun is that if we're just watching and, you know, then we're taking our little data and our notes, like, no. And then take time to observe them. How are they manipulating the game? How are they um, talking about the game? How are they communicating with their speech friends? And then wait, you don't have to jump in at every single opportunity. I mean, opportunities to communicate are great, but just giving time to wait and letting them know that you're there to wait and respond when they need you is really helpful in building that trust and communication. And then listen, listen, listening in, as a speech pathologist, like taking that time to really listen, really just allows for you to be more mindful um, and let your kids know that you're taking time to really listen to them, whether you're listening to their, you know, direct um, reciprocal communication or verbal communication, or whether you're listening to them as they, you know, are trying to figure out a toy and maybe they don't have any verbal words yet, but they've got some approximations or they have some vocalizations. And so you're taking that time to listen to those as well and interpret those. Rock. Um, so this one's fun. So if you're again, when we're thinking about just making the environment fun, especially in those first couple weeks, but you should always be making that environment fun. Um, repeat. Uh, you know, especially if we're thinking about language modeling, like you're repeating a lot of what's going on. And this definitely is something when I'm working in inter early intervention and preschool speech and language. Like this is something that's really helpful. It's kind of really taking that time to repeat. I, I like to think about repeating as repeat what's fun, repeat what they're really like interested in. I have a little girl I'm working with right now who she really loves it when I drop toys from like here and let them fall to the floor. So I repeat it and I, you know, have one, two, three, go all the time on repetition in, in my head and in our sessions. Um, you want to create opportunities for communication but in a way that is more again you're not like purposefully putting I mean putting like the toys up high so the children can request them to come down is an opportunity for communication but maybe just having them be out maybe I like to put them in like a Ziploc um, bag that I can help them open so maybe if they're requesting help that's really great but more so just having opportunities to communicate too can really be about having what they like in the room that's always an opportunity to communicate talking about or somehow interacting with 
something that they enjoy. Um, give cues, one, two, three, go, uh, is a really good one. And keep it fun. I said this, it should always be fun. Always, always. Show interest in what they like. What are they passionate about? So, so ways that you can do this, again, in the beginning, maybe when you send home that um, welcome letter, you can attach a little questionnaire like with like three questions, like what is your child's daily routine? What, uh, what shows, toys, books do they like, songs? Um, and then, of course, that's like a very preschool geared question, but you know, you can kind of change that up. What's their favorite subject? Like, what, what do they uh, talk about a lot? Things like that. So when the, you're bringing them in for their first couple sessions, just again, go back to that observation. Take time to observe. Or another thing that's really helpful, if you do, like for me, I have a whole week. Their first week of school, I don't pull for speech sessions because we want to give them time to acclimate to their school environment. Um, so that first week, that's like your week maybe where you're building your schedule, you're collaborating with teachers. You can also go into the children's classrooms or go out to recess and just observe them. Observe who they're playing with. Observe how they're playing. Observe what they're playing with. Um, what they're talking about. Like those kinds of things. For my preschoolers, I like doing this. I like popping into their classrooms because then I can get to know them and they can see that I'm another teacher. That way it's not scary when I go to pull them to the speech room. Um, and sometimes I'll front load them if they have that kind of uh, understanding of like, oh yeah, you know, um, maybe I go to speech and I'll say, yeah, you were going to go to my room, it's over there, and things like that, just kind of to let them know who I am, know what's coming. Um, let them choose activities, especially those first couple weeks. It's always fun to just kind of let them choose what to play with, what games, give them two choices maybe, um, just to, to see what they gravitate towards and keep it fun, always. And then follow their lead. It's okay if your plan isn't working. It's okay if you don't have a plan. I'm not gonna have a plan, especially the first like three weeks of therapy probably. Uh, okay, maybe the first two weeks. But it's totally okay if like you have a plan and the kids are not interested, then just change it, be flexible. Um, Allowing your student to kind of lead you to what they like or lead you to that interaction and that relationship driven communication and teach you what they enjoy. That's what's going to build a connection. You might have heard me say this if you follow me on Instagram, but we want connection. We will take connection over data collection, right? Anybody with me on that? So, um, yeah. All right. Whew. That was a lot. And there is definitely a little lag on this stream. But if you are in here right now and you have any questions about um, any of that that I just went over, pop them in the chat. I'm going to get to your questions. I want this to be interactive for you. Um, but we are going to get into talking about burnout right now. And then I'm gonna circle back to all these questions right after we talk about this. All right, I'm gonna take a sip of water first. Okay. Before we get into <coughs> all the nitty gritty things about burnout, I wanna talk about ways we can practice mindfulness because we're going to just kind of reflect back on these things as we go. Another reason why I like to have this slide in here is to just kind of get your wheels turning a little bit about maybe ways you're already doing this or things that you're like, oh, I've been wanting to try that. Maybe that's something I can try and set up in my routine or you can be like, Marie totally left so much off this list, but here's mine. And if I did, tell me, um, comment it or put it in the chat. But because um, I, I would love, I would love to add to this list. So here are just some ways: daily gratitude practices. Y'all know, y'all already know. I do it every day in the gratitude journal. Um, gratitude. Look, we're going to do a whole other YouTube live on gratitude and the power of gratitude. I'm really excited for that one. But let me just put it to you this way. Gratitude is like the ultimate life hack. 
because the more you are practicing gratitude, the more you're going to shift your mind to think gratefully, meaning if a situation happens, you will get to a point where you're like, and I'm grateful because, I'm grateful for this opportunity because, and sometimes it's harder than others, but it's definitely something where your mind is, feels a lot more, I don't want to say like, op, it is more optimistic, but you just, you feel like you can really get the joy out of even the smallest moments in life. And it's a really, really beautiful place to be. Now, let me tell you, life kind of is a roller coaster. Like there are seasons where I'm not practicing it the way I have in the past. And there are seasons where I feel myself really in it. Um, and that's, that's okay too. You know, I just kind of meet myself where I'm at. I always give myself grace, but having that practice is like the ultimate mindful thing for me. That's what I've learned. Um, it's just such a good life hack. More on that to come, but there's that. Make time for play. Play is not just for kids. And again, I've done lots of Instagram posts on play. Um, when we play, like really allow ourselves to get outside of our different roles in life and just be, whether, you know, play for you looks being goofy, whether it's just having a family game night and just, you know, <laughs> letting yourself be really competitive while playing Monopoly. Um, whether it's getting outside. Yesterday, Mark and I went to the beach and we were just playing smash ball all day. It's like a paddle ball game. And that was so fun. And I felt like a little kid getting all excited when we hit like 16, you know, uh, what's it called? I don't know, reps, we got rallies. Um, and just, it was just fun. Just, you know, even jumping in the water for him, he went and played in the water. And like, we are allowed to play as adults. And I don't think we hear that enough. And so give yourself permission to play and make time for it. Whether it's in, you know, once a day increments or twice a week increments, once a week, like, ultimately, I would love it if it could be once a day for all of us. But that's just something to keep in mind as far as mindfulness goes. Meditation is a really great one. That's what I'm focusing on next week as I prepare to add add it into my routine, my morning routine for my before work schedule. Um, regular body scans, just checking in with your body. Like that mind-body connection is so powerful. And so when we're checking in with how we feel, anything going on in our body and really take time to breathe with it and just feel it and allow ourselves to see, you know, where we're at, it's really powerful. Um, deep breathing exercises are really great. You can find a lot of different things, but if you do look up anything, I would look up box breathing. Um, I use this a lot, like just five seconds in, hold it for five seconds, five seconds out, hold it for five seconds, and just do rotations of that when I really need it. Like when I get an email that I'm not so stoked about, um, I'll do that before I respond. <laughs> um, yoga, and then outdoor walk, and I put indoors if you, are in an indoor campus and you need to walk around the inside of the campus like but just having that as kind of an outlet if again you need a little transition between sessions or you need to step away from your desk um, and move your body a little bit <clears throat> those are different things you can do so okay mm um we are gonna go into here we go let's do this all right, what can burnout look like? <laughs> well, again, with a list here, this list is, it's different for anybody that's gone through burnout. These are things that I've come up with or I've talked to other people or, you know, in collaboration, we've come up with different things to add to this list in the past, but it could be different for you. So just keep that in mind. Again, add to it. Let me know. Comment um, maybe other ways that you've identified burnout to kind of come up. Uh, but one thing, and, and two, when I say this, like, I really mean this in more of a chronic way. Like, if you're feeling cynical about work, look, there might be a, just a day, whether you call it waking up on the wrong side of the bed or you call it just, I got an email. Again, I always go back to that because it's the easiest example I can think of. But, you know, you get an email or you get a question about something and, like, just for the rest of your day, you feel cynical about work. I get that, but I wouldn't say that it means you're burnt out. I would say that if you're feeling cynical about work, you're feeling negatively about your job um, for weeks and weeks on end, 
and you really can't kick it, that would be a sign that could be a sign that you're getting burnt out or you're already burnt out. Loss of energy. That's a huge one. Even if you're getting sleep, but you're not sleeping, you're probably not getting the right kind of sleep because you are having some stress or some overwhelm. That's a big indicator of burnout. Again, in more of a chronic way. Um, loss of motivation to go into work. This could definitely go hand in hand with all of these things. And all these could come together too. Brain fog. That's when I noticed like I was having it every day for like a month and I was like, I am burnt out. Like it just, it clicked one day. And so when that click came this is like two years ago now I did everything I could to mitigate that and to like slowly climb out of it but it it got me like and and it took me a minute to figure it out but I was literally sitting down at my desk just like zoning out and then with the kids I wasn't present and that's a really good way to put it too like if you're not feeling present then there's some level of maybe burnout um, happening and it doesn't even have to be burnout with your job I've noticed it like social burnout for me um, can definitely do that your inability to focus or being overly consumed with maybe one thing that's bothering you about your job again that's kind of a persistent thing over a week weeks and weeks amount of time um, that can definitely be an indicator that there's some burnout either happening or kind of creeping in so first it's important to identify how it can how it can come up. And again, that list isn't, those aren't the only ways or things that can come up, but those are definitely things that I would say are big indicators. Um, but how can we prevent it or how can we combat it? How can we mitigate it? Well, remember when I talked about knowing your why? Well, when we can like reflect really on our why or focus on what we feel maybe our purpose is, just simply in this role as a speech pathologist, as a school-based SLP, it helps us reflect back on why we got here in the first place. And sometimes it's helpful because it really helps us start to reflect on, is this level of burnout something that is going to happen again if I stay here? Have my values changed? What is actually causing this burnout? And it because it's affected my why, and can I take my why somewhere else? And I know that's really extreme, but it's definitely something that we should be reflecting on. Maybe we do need to a change of um, scenery, so to speak. So they're just things to think about. And, and if you're reflecting on that, you start to kind of line up. Like I know when this happened to me, I started thinking like, well, maybe I, want, I don't want this. And I started thinking about all the reasons why I loved being a school-based SLP even down to the fact that I get a summer break, like all those things. Not that that's the only reason that it keeps me, but there was a lot, the collaboration, the team that I work with, the kids that I work with, the fact that I can advocate for myself. Um, there was just a lot of things that kind of went into that. And, and when I listed all those things out and really reflected because I was focusing on my why and I was thinking about alternative things, like it helped me. So being open to that kind of reflection is really powerful. Um, find a stress net. I laugh because I wrote this and I'm like, not sure what, why I said stress management technique. I guess because it makes sense. It's stress, man stress management technique, but a mindfulness strategy maybe that you can use regularly. I know for me, working out is a huge help to me. So when I do start to feel burnt out, it's kind of funny, but the more I moved my body, so the last time, a couple years ago when I was really going through it, I actually decided, you know what, I was working out three days a week and I was like, I'm going to work out every day, at least for a couple weeks. Like I was coming home from work and it was just a way for me to decompress and kind of process everything and figure out, you know, what do I need to do to really manage my stress, to balance my life better. Um, and so that really did help me. Prioritize your health. That's huge, huge. Like I said, we have... Um, you know, that whole mind-body connection is very important. And when we're prioritizing our health, it really does help take care of our mind. And if we're feeling burnt out, that is the time to focus on what's going to help us get a better night's sleep, to focus on our nutrition. Um, take mental health days. Take one, two, like take what you need to maybe, maybe it is you're taking a mental health day so you can, you know, get on a, a meal prep plan or figure out, you know, go, go to the grocery store and get 
all the foods that you know are good for your body, um, things like that, or you're taking mental health day to sleep, like rest, whatever. But um, that's huge, prioritizing your health. I can't stress that enough. Communicate your needs, self-advocacy. So ask for help. I know this one is hard sometimes. It was hard for me, especially when I was a new SLP. Um, just sharing, you know, oh, my caseload is getting really high with, you know, the powers that be. Uh, can I get another day of slip of support? Or am I able to have another SLP come in and help me manage the paperwork load? Whatever that is, like, whoever you can go to to advocate for, it's really important that you take that time for yourself to advocate what you need. Um, I wish somebody would have been like, Marie, you can advocate. Did you know that? <laughs> Back when I was a new SLP, because I don't think I realized how much I actually could. And um, luckily, when you have that network of SLPs, especially like in my district from my experience you know we all can come together and collaborate and figure out what what we need to be asking for in order to get what's best for us as humans and that's really powerful so how many times am i going to say powerful in this live i swear <laughs> but these are powerful things um lastly here determine what protects your energy i have a little uh, way you can do this and you can keep doing this and checking in with yourself this would be a really good way like if you set up a way to have maybe weekly journal reflections or monthly journal reflections with yourself to just kind of check in with your SLP self um, something you can do every so often is sit and ask yourself what in this season currently lifts me up what gives me energy so for me, for instance, I am an introvert. So something that gives me energy, especially in peak work seasons as a speech pathologist, is slow mornings, right? Slow mornings, maybe like time with myself to just drink coffee and read a book, whatever that is. Um, things, Other things that give me energy, spending time with Mark and uh, my boyfriend and uh, just like being chill, hanging out, cooking dinner, like little things like that. Um, Sleep protects my energy. Like, think about all the things that just lift your energy and give you energy and protect your energy. And then you can think about all the things that don't, the things that take away from it. Maybe it's too much socializing. Maybe it's, um, you know, things not going according to plan. Just all the things that maybe will drain you or frustrate you. Then think about, like, look at that list of the things that can be draining and decrease your energy. And then take, um, look at your other list, your top list of the things that give back and see what you can kind of align. And like anytime you, you know, feel like you, you might over socialize or have, have talked to too many people in a day, then, oh, look, I need to give back to myself with quiet time with myself. I will pull out my book and I will sit and I will read for 15 minutes. Like, you can kind of match those things up to help you. And that's a really big one on burnout prevention because you are kind of creating a self-awareness where you know what you need to do in a mindful and intentional way when things deplete your energy. Okay, moving on. So just something to think about. You can, you can ask this in the chat. You can put this in a comment if you're watching the replay. Um, but if you feel like you want to share this, I would be happy to answer your question again in the comment or after you put it in the chat with, um, if you have any challenges you face with setting boundaries. So I, you know, a good example of one that I got, uh, in a recent training that I did was, you know, I've always been a yes person. So I always say yes. And people know me as the SLP that says yes to everything, but I, I need to start saying no. Um, and that was, you know, we, I was kind of thrown. I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is such a good question. How do you set this boundary? Um, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I just questions like that, that you might find that you have a challenge with. Basically, when it comes to saying no, you just start. That's basically my answer. You start, but you do it in a professional way. Um, and why is it important to set boundaries? Well, you're more than an SLP. You must, at all costs, 
protect your energy because you might have heard this before, but you can't pour from an empty cup. You want to keep your cup overflowing, ultimately. That's the ideal situation. Now, we're human. Things come up. We need to, you know, stop what we're doing to go help a student who is having a communication breakdown in the classroom across the hall. Like, and we were taking five minutes to do deep breathing. Like, understandable. So we want to be able to come back and whether it's resuming where we were at with some of our mindfulness strategies or just understanding that when things come up, we can readjust and we will give ourselves grace, we'll give others grace, um, and move on from there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <laughs> I like this one, but it doesn't work for everybody. Don't check your email outside of work. Now, I used to say this all the time, and this used to literally be something I told other SLPs to do. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm telling you to do this if you're like me, and you in the past have felt so tethered to your phone that it was causing you to lose presence when you left your contract hour day. If you were coming home and still checking your work email, letting the notifications distract you when you're in the middle of a conversation, talking about your day with your partner, um, this that was something that I ended up doing after my first year. I took the I took the email off my phone, like the Outlook app, I took it off my phone, so I could only check it if I was on my computer. People have my number, they can text me and say, can you check your email? Okay. Um, but I made a point not to check it on weekends and really set that standard for myself. And so at this point, seven years in, most everybody knows I won't be checking my email on Saturday or Sunday. Again, if it's an emergency, they'll call me, they'll text me, but um, that is something that has been really helpful for me now. If you aren't somebody who can do that because you actually get more stressed out by not knowing. So I had an, a good example is I had a conversation with um, a teacher who said that she, she had a time that she stopped checking her email every day, which was 7 p.m., but she liked to be able to respond to parents first thing in the morning. So what she would do is if, you know, they had emailed her you know, obviously by 7 p.m. because that's when she would stop checking. She wouldn't respond right away. She didn't. She wanted to make sure she wasn't available to them at all hours of the day, but she wanted to be able to draft her response so she didn't have to be thinking about it like going to sleep. I can totally understand that. So there are different ways that we go about setting these boundaries, but it is something really important to think about. It's so simple, but your email. How accessible are you allowing yourself to be, one, outside of your contract day, but two, as an SLP, like where where are you falling? Are you a human first, or are you trying to be 100% accessible as an SLP? Um, because that is going to that can definitely cause some level of SLP burnout because then you have kind of depleted you know your ability to be present in other areas of your life. Um, so just that's something for us all to be considering all the time. Same thing goes for social media, by the way. I have, I have, I put timers on my phone now. <laughs> don't, don't get on it all the time. Um, communicate your needs or self-advocacy and say no. <laughs> we're gonna, like I said, we're talking about say no. Say no is a good one. Um, oh, I went too fast. Okay, so let's dive into these last two pieces. Communicate your needs and self-advocacy. So this is something that when we're setting boundaries, we may not know what we exactly what we need or what we need to advocate for right away. So when you're setting up your school year and you're thinking about that list of questions, you can also have another list as you go. The first couple weeks, first three weeks, first month may take a full year for you to really determine what it is you kind of need in your environment, what it is you need as far as support. Um, and then how you can advocate for yourself um, as a speech language pathologist. So a really good example of this that I, I take from my own life is when my caseload got really high my second year as a speech pathologist, I was still fairly new. I was brand new to the preschool team. I didn't realize that I wasn't supposed to have as many students on my caseload as I did. 
And I contacted, I finally contacted somebody because another SLP told me, no, you need to, you need to request some SLPA support. So I um, called our program director and she was, you know, very understanding. And she said, you know, Marie, because I said, it's, it's been growing since October. Like, and she's like, well, we don't always see it, if, you know, at the district office or wherever, because they obviously, I get that. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of employees. Like, I am one person. So she did tell me, like, you've got to make sure you're letting us know as things go. And so that definitely taught me something um, about, you know, how how to self-advocate. Basically, like, as soon as something feels a little off, I need to, I need to speak up. Um, but I also kind of learned that when we're when I'm advocating for myself I actually it's not in me to be very confrontational I'm not a very confrontational person but when it comes to my needs I I need to just be very assertive and kind of throw out there what exactly the situation is so if I have so many kids on my caseload throwing out you know these are these are the numbers and then I also have this amount of students that maybe have AAC devices and that requires more planning time and prep time and I need a SLPA to be able to help me with that. Um, or I have, you know, I've had so many meetings this year because we've had people requesting, you know, more meetings and so that's requiring more time from me. Um, so just being very direct about and very specific about what it is that I need and why I need it. So that's kind of my two cents there um, and then saying no <laughs> so when I got that question of like I've always been a yes person how do I start being a no person I was like well you just you start but you can be very upfront and honest as much as you feel comfortable being and as much as you want to be you know you just say I know I've said yes to this in the past but I have found that I get burnt out when I say yes to too many things so I need to be an advocate for myself in this situation and say, no, not right now, but, and you can always, you know, say, but I can do it at this time, or you say, or I can help in this capacity. I know there's this fine line sometimes of setting boundaries and then being a team player. I've definitely teetered on the line. Um, last year, I was very much a say no boundary person. Um, this year, I do want to be more of like a team player while finding that balance of setting boundaries because it is important to be a team player, especially in the schools. Again, I am now going into my seventh year. We get new SLPs every year that have that list of questions and they send it out. And I want to be one of the SLPs that can respond and make the time for them um, and be that team player instead of saying, well, no, everybody else can handle this situation, so I'm not going to bother because. I have my time is better spent elsewhere. I'm trying to figure out where I can balance things out a little bit um, and be more of a support in that way. But when you are starting out, it's so easy to fall into just wanting to say yes to almost people please in a way, and we don't have to. And something that goes along with saying no that I have found to be really helpful is adding a bit of education in. So an example of this is I got asked a long, long time ago to help out with like the drop-off and pickup duty on my campus. Um, in my contract, in my SLP contract, it actually doesn't state that, that I do that because SLPs have that time for paperwork and we have that time for prep, different things. It's just different than teachers in that way. Um, and I got asked to, and instead of saying, no, it's not in my contract, because that's like, didn't feel natural for me to say, although it's very valid. I was actually in the middle of prepping a session for one of my students who, like I was prepping an obstacle course for him because he needs movement in his session and it took a lot of prep. Um, and so, you know, principal walked in and was like, can you go help? And I said, I have a student in like 10 minutes and I need to get my room in order for him. Um, I said, I'm happy to try and help maybe like if you need it tomorrow. So that was my no, but but I also threw in that education piece of why. Like I, I'm prepping for this student, prepping for Johnny, you know, he knew who Johnny was, and he was like, oh, okay, no, say less. Like, you, you, I get it, like, thank you for letting me know. But just that education piece, and also sometimes as SLPs, and I don't wanna sound like a broken record saying this, but it is true that less is known, it, more is known now about our job than it used to be. 
thank goodness. And I think a lot of that has to do with one, social media. There's a lot more out there now and that's really beautiful. But two, I think a lot of us have realized people don't exactly know what we do and so they ask us to do things and actually we, we need the time allotted in these other areas because we do so much of this other stuff. So that education piece is so big and um, just taking time to really let other staff and let other people know this is what I actually am doing in a day. I know it looks like I'm playing, but really I am focusing on all of these different things and look at this list of goals that my student is working on. So just that, you know, obviously in a very professional way, letting other people know what it is we do is a very good way to one, advocate ourselves, two, set some boundaries, and three, you know, give ourselves that ability to say no to things that maybe don't fall within our, I hate to say it like this, but in our job description or in our role, right? It's like looking at the scope of practice almost. I just spit, sorry, I just saw that, but yeah. Um, this next thing I want you to think about before we move on to the very end here is, are you confident taking mindfulness practices into your speech therapy sessions. And I feel like I just breeze through all the, these other things really fast. Um, but again, this is recorded. Um, so if you need to go back and kind of listen, or if you have questions, pop them in the comments and I will make sure I either answer them, I type them in, or I can always make another video um, to answer them as we go. But this last piece here, we're gonna talk about bringing mindfulness into your speech sessions. It's really quick because I really just want you to first think about are you confident taking mindfulness practices into your speech therapy sessions? You might be like, oh yeah, I know exactly what to do. I know how to create maybe a mindful moment for my kids. Um, I do it at the beginning of every speech session. I do it at the end, like whatever it is. Or maybe you're like, what? how? How would I bring a mindfulness session into a group of middle schoolers or a group of preschoolers or, you know, whatever? I'm going to show you. There is, There are ways. And the very first thing that you're doing, you're probably already doing, is making time to listen. Just listen. Like, kids, whether they have verbal speech or not, are, they are expressing emotions. And when we take time to listen to those emotions and really kind of allow them to have a space for them, it's really big. Um, it lets them know, again, we want to create that safe environment to have that relationship driven communication so when we are mindful and intentional about the time we're taking to just listen or even you know if you have a group of kids that are older and you know you can literally say how are you all feeling today like at the start of a session and like talk about it the thing I love about bringing kids into my speech room especially once we've established rapport and <clears throat> built connections that over the first couple maybe months of the school year I love how transparent they are I mean I don't get many kids anymore that are like, I'm fine, I'm good. I don't, I don't think I've ever had a kid be like that. Like, kids are very honest and when they tell you, I'm mad today, like talk about it. Well, why are you mad today? And you know, oh, well, I got cut in front of in the lunch line and like I remember this happened when I was working with a third grader and I just was like, man, I would be mad at that too. Like that right there is intentional communication. It's mindful, it's acknowledging, it's validating. And in school, while I know so many, there's so many more conversations happening about like taking these time for mindful moments now, which I'm really appreciative of, but I still see that whether they're in preschool or they're in middle school or they're high school, like things are so fast paced for these kids. And I don't think enough time is taken just to listen, just to be that listening ear, that validating adult or communication partner and then when you're doing that, you're modeling that for them. You're modeling that for any of the other kids in their speech group. And it's just, it's such a good way to make that time for them. So that's the first thing, like I said, you're probably already doing it. Um, daily affirmations, those are really fun. I don't know why it's not near me, but is it near me? No, I think it's downstairs. On Amazon, I actually, I'll have to link it. Yeah, I'll have to link it in the, I'll link it in the caption of this video. But they, I have it in my storefront. It's like a pack of mindful activities for kids. And I've done it with preschoolers. I've done it with um, like school age, like third graders, where they pick a card. There's like different kinds of cards. There's like ones for actual like exercises. So there's like yoga poses and breathing. There's some for affirmations. But like they'll pick a card and then we'll 
will do whatever it says. So like, let's say we're doing the affirmations one, we'll pick it and if they're not readers yet, and then I say, okay, everybody's gonna repeat after me. Um, and we say the affirmation, so like, we'll make it really easy. We'll say, I am great. And then they'll say, I am great. And then we'll talk about it. Like, I am great. I am great at painting. I am great at playing on the playground. Like, just things that are relatable to them where they're at. And then, you know, if they're older, have them come up with what they're great at. But just having that moment to ha say some daily affirmations. It literally can take two minutes of your speech session. It could be a really fun language activity and you could let it take 15. I don't know. I don't care. But like, it's, it's just a really good way to bring that again, that mindfulness, being intentional about your connection into your speech room. Breathing exercises. Honestly, I've done this with my preschoolers. Um, I've also done little yoga poses. Uh, I have a little like cards that have little poses. And so then we do them, you get imitation out of it, but also you're like relaxing. Um, breathing exercises are fun sometimes i'll just sit down and you can feel the jumpy energy and even with kids like four-year-olds you feel it and so i'll just say you know what let's all take a breath and it doesn't have to be this like very like you know i don't know i don't know how to say it but you don't have to be super enthusiastic about it you can be and that's great but it could just be a very calming thing that you all do together just to kind of feel grounding in the speech room and in the environment and it's really helpful and I do notice when I just do that it just alleviates so much tension um, and honestly nine times out of ten the reason I'm doing it is because I'm feeling tense and I know that when I bring any tension or anxiety down in my speech sessions the kids feel it we feel we feel what another person is giving off and I don't want to lose presence in my speech sessions. I don't want me to lose it, but I don't want my kids to lose it either. Um, other things you could do, writing activities, drawing, you could have them sing songs about how they feel. Um, I have little free prompts on my website actually where you can have kids draw what makes them happy, draw what they're grateful about, write what they're grateful about. So those are really good activities. Again, just takes a few moments, build that into your session. You can create a language thing out of it. You don't have to, like it could just be for that connection and that's beautiful and okay on its own. And then I talked about this when I said making time to listen, but acknowledging emotions. All emotions are valid. All emotions are allowed and letting kids know they have permission to feel what they feel is really huge. And I just don't think they hear it enough throughout their school day. And I could be wrong, um, but I personally don't, haven't seen that that is something in preschool, I feel like it is. In preschool, we're always talking about emotions, but as they get older, there's such an emphasis on other things as they go through their day, and there's so much to do. And so we wanna make sure that they have that ability to have their emotions acknowledged. We're done. This, this was great. I, it went a little longer than I anticipated, but I really want to say thank you for being here. And I do have something special for you for making it through with me through all the technological issues. Um, so hold on. I'm gonna, we're going to get back to this slide, but I do have a back to school gift for you. Did you know I have a course called the Thriving School Based SLP? It is a self-paced course for school speech pathologists. You get 3.75 hours of professional development learning. So those are it is continuing education. They are not ASHA CEUs because I'm not, the course isn't signed up through the ASHA registry, so you have to document them on your own. But this is your guide on maintaining life work balance and managing your daily tasks as a school based SLP. So everything in it has a little bit of what we covered today and a lot more. There's actually eight modules six modules, two bonus modules. Um, we're talking about establishing meaningful connections with students. We go a lot deeper than we did today. Collaboration in the schools, what it can look like, how we can modify things for students, all the different ways that we collaborate with teachers. We talk about push in therapy because that's been a really big thing for a lot of us. Um, there's a module on supporting behavioral needs of students. There's a module on planning and not planning your therapy sessions, which I love that module. That was my most fun module, I think, because I talk a lot about improv. Um, I also have uh, two modules on more of like the nitty gritty things. So we talk about collecting data effectively and efficiently. And funny enough, the most questions I've gotten have been about data. Like after putting this out, just like wanting to see more of the data stuff. <laughs> so um, I, have, I have some content coming on that because I thought that was so funny that, you know, of all the things like data collection is something that you're all thinking about. So I was really glad we had a module on it. Um, and I, uh, 
I will be I will be basically showing you my data binder once I get back in my speech room is, is the idea behind that. Um, we also talk about writing and running successful IEP meetings. Uh, so that's really good. And then the bonus modules, one is on m more of the mindfulness, bringing that into the speech room. So we go into more depth on how we can be intentional and bring mindfulness into our speech sessions. And then the second one is on being a neurodiversity affirming speech therapist in the schools. That is something I'm still learning about, but I was so excited after doing a training with Jesse Ginsburg and um, Christopher Winger, so Speech Dude and Sensory SLP, <laughs> if you know them by their handles on Instagram. Uh, they came out, they did a training for our um, Kesha region, and I was so grateful to get to attend and learn so much about how we can bring this conversation as school-based speech therapists into our settings, because it's easier, I feel like, from what I've seen to do maybe if we're a private practice uh, SLP or for a private contractor, but as a school-based SLP with so many different service providers to collaborate with and teachers and admin and all these things and all this, you know, all, all the little boxes and hoops to jump through, like talking about that was really exciting. So I'm really excited that I could bring that to you and kind of show you what I've learned. Um, so if you use the code SCHOOLBASED SLP, you get 25% off now through July 31st. After that, it goes back up. Um, you also get handouts to support your daily tasks as a school SLP. I have parent handouts for you as a part of this. And again, you get that 3.7 hours towards your continuing education, which is awesome. Um, I was just so grateful I got to, I got to include that bit too. Um, so there's the code. If you need to screenshot this really quick, please do. You just say school SLP and it will be there. Um, I haven't linked it yet on here because of all the technology issues because it was linked and then I had to start a whole new live. So I'm going to, as soon as this is over and saved, I will link it, but if you just go to thanksmorris.com right now, you'll see it. It pops up on the, the very top. Um, that's it, that's it. So thank you so much. Again, any questions that you have about the any content that I went over here with you, um, pop it in the comments and I will respond. I will, whether it's make you a video, I'll answer your question in there. Um, but I'm just so happy to connect with you. You can find me on Instagram at Thanks Morris. Um, if you have more detailed questions you want to just chat with me about, email me, Marie at thanksmorris.com, or you can DM me on Instagram. Honestly, DMing me is probably the quickest way to get a hold of me, but um, either will work. All right. So thank you so much. I'm going to do this really quick. There we go. Um, for being here. And uh, I can't wait to see you on the next YouTube Live. This was so fun. And uh, yeah, see you next time.